when we're uh, looking at a voting method, just for some additional background, uh, voting method has to do all these things. Uh, so its primary objective is uh, it should be electing a good winner. Like that's, that's its main uh, job. Uh, but a voting method has these other attributes as well, um, such as like you, uh, if you can make it simple, you should be able to make it simple um, and uh, have it all else equal, um, uh, preferring uh, simplicity, thinking about logistics with carrying out uh, the administration for a voting method. Um, and then also uh, looking at the reflection of support that it provides for each candidate. So not only is a voting method, uh, is it supposed to be able to uh, elect a good winner or, or select a good winner or set of winners um, with the candidates who don't win, uh, it should also gauge their support well. Um, and that's important because if a candidate really has a lot of support, but it's not showing up, then they could get marginalized in a way that's unfair, that keeps their ideas from being heard. Um, so, uh, and uh, so that's kind of a, of a background in terms of when we're looking at voting methods, like, well, first, like what, what a voting method is, uh, some of the things that we're looking at when um, we're uh, comparing or evaluating voting methods. Um, and for, for this call, one of the things that uh, we like to go into is uh, obvious, obviously we have uh, um, a worldwide crisis right now. We have an active pandemic. And so uh, there are some uh, uh, factors that really come into play in terms of really highlighting the importance. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and part of that is um, planning for the, uh, uh, for the next uh, inevitable crisis. Like we, uh, as a society, we, we go through challenges all the time. The, the scale of those challenges can, uh, can vary from, from moment to moment, but we will inevitably have uh, complex problems that we have to solve in the future. So uh, one uh, way that a voting method comes into play is that um, we want, uh, a voting method that has uh, strong continuity. So if we're looking at something where a government has to uh, do planning and management to be able to uh, mitigate disasters, uh, those, are, uh, those are complicated. Uh, um, uh, that, that, that's a, 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 um, it's a complicated mm -hmm. structure to have to, to set up. Um, and you don't want a, uh, something where you have a particular administration that is working to set all this up, and yet the next administration comes along and decides, like, you know what, that's, that's not a good idea, um, and then they break it all down, and then uh, the administration after that, uh, they decide, well, that first administration had it right, and you have this kind of pendulum effect going back and forth. Um, and that's something that you can experience with the current voting method that, that we have. Uh, and that makes it very difficult to plan for uh, disasters that, that, that inevitably will, will come up. Um, one of the reasons that we like uh, approval voting, which is the, the method that, that we advanced. Um, so as a, as a, a recap, um, approval voting is a voting method that allows you to select as many candidates as you want and the candidate with the most votes wins. Um, so it's a very simple method. Uh, one of the perks of that method is that it tends to elect a more a consensus style winner um, uh, versus uh, the current voting method that we have that can kind of have this pendulum effect of electing someone from one end of the continuum for one election and then the next, in, uh, next election swing to the, the other side. Uh, with approval voting, it tends to focus on a more consensus style candidate uh, so you have more continuity and you don't have these wild swings. And being able to have that kind of continuity in government is helpful when you want to have long-term planning. So when you do want to do uh, pandemic uh, preparedness or, or other complicated long-term projects that require a lot of management um, and able to have um, uh, uh, these plans carry over from administration to administration. Another component is uh, so in the beginning, we talked about um, what, uh, what are the types of attributes that, that make a, a voting method good. The, the top one there is 
uh, it should elect a good winner. And so uh, we see that uh, being increasingly apparent right now uh, in terms of having uh, strong leadership. So approval voting uh, focused as, uh, uh, you can use it for multi-winner elections, um, but uh, in kind of its classic uh, uh, state, it's used for executive positions. And uh, we want a good voting method like approval voting uh, so that we can elect strong people to these executive positions because ultimately when times like this come up, we need people who are strong in leadership and being able to uh, uh, manage the, these complicated situations. Uh, we don't want a voting method that um, elects someone uh, that is not able to handle these situations or um, makes poor decisions. Uh, and another component is when uh, one of the nice features of approval voting is that it, it gets these, uh, so even if a candidate doesn't win, uh, because you can always support your honest favorite in approval voting, it means that you don't have to worry about uh, wasting your vote when people bring new ideas to the table. And new ideas may be just what are necessary uh, in order to uh, mitigate challenges that, that we have. Uh, and so if we have a voting method that fails to capture that support from uh, these, other, um, these other candidates, uh, we can miss out on these ideas and being able to mitigate these situations. Um, so those are, those are some of the highlights here in terms of why a voting method uh, matters and how it can apply to uh, these types of, of crises. Um, so if we want to uh, do some uh, questions, uh, um, be happy to hear uh, what people's uh, thoughts are in terms of um, how the, the voting method can, uh, can apply here. Hi, and you can um, also, yeah. My, my name is Alan. Uh, I'm from Fairfield, California. Um, can you Alan. talk a little bit about how um, how voting reform might detoxify our politics? Um, like right now with my friend group, it, it's hard to even bring up politics because it's taboo. And I think that the voting system has something to do with that. Uh, in that it is polarizing and can uh, approval voting help with that? And if so, how? Yeah. So uh, any, so one reason that we can find ourselves in this uh, uh, toxic environment, and, and thanks Ellen for the, for the question. Um, one reason that we can find ourselves in this environment is uh, because of the way that we vote normally. So when we vote normally, we're forced to uh, choose uh, just one uh, candidate. Um, and what, what that does is it, it has, uh, it forces us to not provide information of all the candidates that, uh, that are there. And obviously we have feelings about um, practically all the candidates uh, and not just the one that we express information about. So this is really providing a scenario where we can't provide, uh, uh, where we can hardly provide any information at all. And we might think about how this plays out, for instance, in the, in the primaries. Uh, so uh, we saw in the Democratic primary, for instance, that there was some hostility between uh, uh, some of the supporters from, from different campaigns. Uh, whereas it, if you kind of think about it and take a step back, it, it feels kind of weird for, for some of them. And that when, uh, when, uh, when we look at them just kind of like uh, afar, it looks like they have a lot in common. And yet uh, we're seeing a little bit of, uh, of animosity there. And part of that is that, uh, and we had done a poll on this too. Uh, when, so when we gave people the option to choose multiple candidates, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, they took that opportunity. And so there are a couple articles in particular that see how that, uh, plays out. There is one, um, and uh, Caitlin can uh, uh, add them into the uh, into the chat window. Uh, one is looking at the uh, uh, a poll that we had done just before Super Tuesday, and then another one was looking at the election, taking a snapshot in November. And there we had compared 
multiple different uh, voting methods. Uh, and so uh, what, what you see there is that when people are given the option to choose more candidates, they, they do. And that can, that can play a heavy role in terms of the way that we're able to com communicate about um, uh, politics. So for instance, if uh, uh, we see a couple of candidates with similar ideas, um, we can look at them and say like, hey, like both of these candidates are doing uh, like from your personal perspective, you could say, oh, well, they're, they're really supporting this issue that I care about. Uh, I'm really excited about both of them. Whereas uh, when we're forced under the scenario with this choose one voting method that we're stuck with now, when we're, when we're looking at it under that lens of this choose one voting method, now we can't say, well, I like both of those candidates. I, uh, I like to support them both. We're in a position where we're having to like push between those candidates and really uh, force that divisiveness. And that's merely the consequence of being able to provide such little information. So approval voting, being able to support multiple candidates really does help to uh, potentially address that situation by allowing, uh, uh, by making it so voters don't get stuck in the situation where they're forced to choose and support only one candidate, even when they lack the ideas of multiple candidates. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Hello. Oh, hello. Yeah. yeah. Hi, this is Joyce from Seattle. Hi, and Joyce. Hi. So I just have a few things I'd like to say, and maybe you could jot them down. And if you want to talk about any of them, that'd be great. And I'll just lay them out. All right. Um, I believe we should have all paper mail-in ballots like we have in the state of Washington. I believe that all Americans should be automatically registered to vote at age 16. I don't think you have to ever uh, prove a party affiliation in order to vote. I think we should have rank choice voting where you pick your first second and third choice and it does not have to be in any particular party it's just whoever you like um, i think all primaries should have these mail-in ballots due on the same day and no states go before any other that there should be no more caucuses and this kind of disparity between caucuses and primaries based on state by state it should all be um, primaries and let me see if there's anything else. Um, and the, the winner should win by popular vote only. Well, well, there may be uh, other things I just can't think of them all right now. Okay. Well, we, we, you've, you've laid out a, 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 nice, a nice wish list there. Um, uh, and, and I think a lot of, a lot of these uh, come into play um, uh, right now. Um, uh, so we're seeing, um, although it's uh, uh, a little uh, outside the scope of the, the voting methods that we look at, look at, but it's certainly uh, adjacent uh, looking at, um, for instance, at, uh, at paper ballots, um, uh, per perhaps something else that uh, you, you uh, might like to add to the list is something like uh, risk limiting audits. Uh, I know uh, Colorado has taken the, the lead in that. So there, there are a lot of adjacent um, uh, uh, measures uh, that um, uh, that that support um, uh, our democracy. Um, with uh, with with our organization, we do um, uh, focus a bit more on approval voting. Um, so the the bar is pretty low to uh, be where we're at now. Uh, so uh, stuck with this choose one voting method. Um, uh, it's kind of when we look at the options that we have for for voting methods, it really uh, 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 this choose one voting method is really the bottom of the barrel in terms of, of options uh, that we have. Um, so looking at the, uh, so Caitlin looked at, uh, shared the, if you look in the chat, the um, Super Tuesday poll as well as the uh, November poll that we had. And one of the interesting things that really kind of helps to highlight one of the reasons that we uh, push approval voting over some of the other options. Uh, so uh, there, we didn't see uh, so much of a of a difference with uh, the winner of the election. Um, but what we did see was a big difference in terms of the reflection of support that other candidates got. Um, and 
one cool thing that we did, which I'm really proud of, of our team for, for putting together, is we had a, a control measure uh, for, both, for both of those polls. Um, so we had an honest assessment control measure where we asked people, okay, uh, tell me what you think about these candidates on a scale of zero to five, and just we want you to be honest with your assessment. We're not talking about viability. Um, we just want you to assess these candidates. Um, and oh, it looks like uh, for late joiners, they, they can't see the earlier uh, link there. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll blame Zoom on that one. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we had this, this control measure on top of that. And for the second one, uh, we had a, a, an extra cool uh, control measure. And th that second one was we, uh, much like the other control measure, kind of having a utility or a type of a Likert scale, uh, for the other one, we asked people to rank uh, their, their options um, in an honest way. Uh, so in kind of a similar fashion with uh, the way that we did for the, uh, for the scale. And we use that to see how candidates would do head to head. Uh, so, uh, so you can, so we had these control measures uh, for these uh, kind of honest control measures uh, for these polls as well. And when you look at those and you superimpose them over the results that we got, you see that approval voting really did the best out of the voting methods that were there, which, it, which also included the choose one voting method, as well as um, the ranked choice voting method. Um, both, uh, uh, so ranked choice voting, for instance, did better than uh, the choose one voting method in terms of capturing that support for the other candidates. Um, but uh, when you compare it to that control measure, uh, you see that it really falls short and kind of fumbles a bit in a number of areas with that candidate list. Um, in both the November poll and the one on Super Tuesday. And this is also a within, uh, within subject design. So each respondent is, re is replying using multiple voting methods. Uh, and that's a way, like, it's a technical way of reducing error within, within the study. Um, but when you look at approval voting, for instance, um, it, it doesn't perfectly align, but it comes pretty close to the, to the control measure. Um, and it does uh, much better than both the ranked choice voting method as well as with the uh, choose one voting method. Uh, and you get that nice reflection of support. So not only do you get that clear winner who matches the high utility score and the beat all winner with the control measure um, for, for that particular sample. Uh, so not only do you get that, but you get that nice reflection of support um, all at the low price of a very low complexity cost. So you get, so you're getting that with a voting method that uh, it's very easy to express information on a ballot. It looks basically like a normal ballot. You're just picking as many as you want. And it's easy for people to understand, um, which is just simply adding the votes. So for that low uh, cost of complexity, you're getting these nice results that match well, even against a, a nice control measure. So how does that appear on the ballot? Are uh, you saying, I mean, like you're saying, I don't understand. So rank choice would mean you pick your first, second, and third choice. How does this approval method show up on a ballot? Uh, so maybe we can add another link in there uh, so we get some, some visuals. Uh, Kayla, maybe you can add some. Uh, she's already, Kayla's already on it. I see her typing away. So. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, as, as uh, uh, so there's that, approval voting 101 uh, link that okay. Kayla just added in there. Uh, and one of the things that you can tell from that is that uh, the, the ballot looks a lot like our normal ballot. So when you go to vote normally, you see um, like your list of options and you get like a, a box next to each of the options. And normally it says, just check one of those boxes. Um, uh, and that's what we're used to. Uh, with approval voting, you're still electing one person here uh, but instead of checking one box, you can still check one box if you like. In some cases, that makes sense still. But you're allowed to check as many boxes as you want. Um, and that's the only difference. You'd still add up uh, the check marks, most votes wins. Uh, for, uh, for some folks in the, in the, uh, that are a bit more uh, techy, uh, you might think of it as a difference between a radio button uh, that we normally see uh, that allows you to pick just one option, like doing an online uh, survey uh, versus uh, a checkbox which uh, on online, which allows you to pick as many as you want. Uh, so for folks that are 
thinking about it in like maybe a user experience thing with uh, like internet forums, that's perhaps another way to think about it. But isn't that rank choice anyway, because you're picking more than one person? Yeah, so that's interesting. So there are, there are a lot of different voting methods that allow us to express more information. So a, a voting method, it has these parts to it. So uh, a voting method has the expression element uh, where you're putting information down. And that information can be all kinds of different information. It could be choosing just one, uh, it could be ranking, could be selecting more, as many as you want, could be scoring on a scale. And then you gotta do uh, something with that information. Uh, and if we look just within the class of ranking methods, so like it's, it's uh, rank choice voting has a little bit of a weird name in that like it, it overlaps with the, an entire class of voting methods. Uh, it has other names, which and in the field of voting methods, I think uh, the field does kind of a bad job in naming stuff. So like we, we see a bunch of voting methods with multiple different names, like even the me method that we use now, uh, we're maybe a bit guilty of it ourselves and that we call it a choose one method to try to add simplicity to it, but it goes by plurality voting, first past the post. Uh, ranked choice voting that we're talking about also goes by like instant runoff voting, hair method, alternate method. Like it's got a long, a long list. Uh, so we're, we're, we're very bad about this and I'll apologize on all of our behalfs on doing such a bad job with uh, the, the naming within the field of, of, of uh, voting theory. Uh, so when, if we're looking at, uh, uh, say, like ranking methods, there are all kinds of ranking methods. Uh, so uh, there's ranked choice voting, also known as instant runoff voting. Uh, the way that works is that you um, rank candidates numerically uh, from the candidate like you like the most, you rank them first, all the way to the uh, candidate that you like the least. And then it looks at the candidate who has the, um, uh, 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 so you look at the first choice votes. If a candidate has more than half of the first choice votes, then you have a winner. Uh, if not, uh, you look to the candidate with the fewest first choice votes, eliminate that candidate, and then uh, transfer those votes over to the voter's next choice preference. Um, and then you retally looking at the first choice votes again. Someone has more than half, uh, you've got a winner. If not, you keep doing that cycle. Uh, and so that, that's, I would say, kind of moderate uh, complexity in terms of voting methods when we think about the uh, like the whole survey of voting method options that we have out there. Uh, but there are other ranking methods as well. So for instance, um, another one is board account. Um, you again are using ranking data. So from the voters perspective, it looks the same, but from the calculation component, that other important part of a voting method, um, you take those rankings and then you translate them to scores. So a candidate ranked as better, gets a higher score, um, and then it diminishes on down the, the rankings. Um, another one is uh, a class of ranking methods called Condorcet methods. Uh, what a Condorcet method does is it uses those rankings to simulate pairwise comparisons between um, all, the, all the other candidates. Uh, and you can see that we, we in that second one, the uh, article looking at the Super Tuesday, uh, we use the honest rankings to set up a Condorcet matrix. So you see this pairwise comparison thing. Um, if you ever look at uh, uh, like contests or sporting events, um, you may uh, have heard of um, uh, a round robin table. So you could think about it like that as well. Uh, so a Condorcet method, another type of ranking method, uses those rankings to simulate who is able to win head to head um, using all that ranking data. So uh, the, the mere fact that we have a voting method that's providing more information than choosing just one candidate uh, doesn't uh, mean that it's uh, right choice voting. It just means that like it's not the choose one voting method that we have. Um, so uh, fortunately we're in a position where we have all kinds of options. And um, the reason we go with approval voting is because uh, not only does it do well in its major job of choosing that winner, um, but it has some extra bonuses too. So uh, like, like we can see in those articles, it does a good job gauging support for other candidates, even when they don't win. And then on top of that, you're getting all this great stuff uh, for very little complexity. So it looks practically like the same ballot that we have now, really easy to calculate. And we get some extra bonuses, like um, it has features like being precinct summable, which is nice for administration. 
Um, that means that you don't need all the ballot data together in one place. You can do it precinct by precinct. Uh, it makes, uh, you, can, you can do audits with uh, instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting, um, but it's also a bit, it's quite a bit easier to do it with approval voting. Uh, so, you, so that simplicity also uh, integrates with, with other components as well. So thanks for the question, Joyce. You're welcome. I just was wondering if you're looking, I don't want to dominate the questions here, but if you're looking at a ballot and you're using this method, can you just tell me how it would look if you say you had these names on the ballot for a primary? So you had Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden, and Pete Buttigieg or something. Mm -hmm. How would that appear other than boxes with their name next to it? That's I don't understand that. The same. That's a beautiful yeah. thing. It's exactly the same. You can just check more than one. So you could say, I like, you know, I could say, I like uh, Bernie and Elizabeth Warren. I can check both instead of just one. Or in the last city Not council, I can, you know, check everyone but the guys Amazon wrote the checks to. Like, that's the Not idea. one more than another? I mean, you're putting uh, Bernie and Elizabeth equal or what? Yep. You're just approving. Just approving. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the way that you would tell the difference between an approval voting ballot and um, this choose one ballot that we're used to is the directions. Uh, so the directions, normally it says choose no more than one candidate. Um, the directions would be replaced from um, choose as many candidates as you approve of uh, or as many candidates as you wish. There, there are a number of different phrasings, but the key element is you can choose one or more. I think what Joyce might be getting at is uh, there's an intuitive sense that if I'm ranking candidates, I'm giving more information. So that means I'm going to get a better outcome. Uh, but I think what you were getting at before is that in fact, even though the you are giving more outcome information in some sense, the way that those votes are tallied up can end up uh, not producing better uh, outcomes in the result. Um, but still, I think we should all remember here, if you're in an area where one of these alternatives, whether it's star or ranked choice or approval, if any of those has momentum and you're part of one of those movements, please continue working on those movements because it's so much more important that we get away from, from plurality than that we like pick the perfect alternative right now. Yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's one area where, uh, we, uh, where uh, we, we highlight. So uh, a lot of uh, advocates in the, in the space, uh, one of our favorite, uh, 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 things to uh, things to do as a group is to uh, 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 put plurality voting in the center and kind of beat up on it a bit. Um, so that that's one of our favorite pastimes uh, in in this uh, in this space. Uh, and so, um, kind of like on that on that note, uh, uh, let's uh, we can perhaps do that uh, that a bit. Um, so. Uh, for instance, the, the primary itself, uh, when we look at, um, for instance, the, the, the data that we collected, comparing it just to the, to the control measure, um, we see that among the voting methods that we looked at, uh, plurality voting did the absolute worst uh, that there was. Uh, we have a gauge of what that reflection of support um, looks like when people express information honestly, and uh, plurality voting uh, uh, really messes up um, so in the November one, it failed to distinguish uh, uh, among the, the, the leaders there, even though there was a clear leader according to the, um, uh, to the control data. And then it just completely failed and collapsed in terms of trying to gauge that support for these other candidates as well. Uh, the only thing that our choose one voting method has going for it is that it's simple and um, people have used it before. Uh, and that's about the end of the list of things that it's got going for it. Um, and that's one reason why we're seeing all of these other approaches uh, spark up. Uh, so we have like a, a number, there, there are a number of different organizations out there. 
um, that have uh, that push for different methods. Uh, and uh, uh, if we uh, imagine uh, the uh, voting methods uh, like uh, it, uh, so we, we, we talked about uh, this, this idea of a, a Condorcet winner. So a Condorcet winner is a, a candidate who can beat everyone else head to head. Um, there's also this concept in voting theory called a, a Condorcet uh, loser. Uh, and so uh, that's a, a candidate who would uh, lose to everyone head to head. And that, that candidate would certainly be uh, our choose one voting method. Uh, if, if we stacked it up against all the other options. Um, so, so thanks uh, for the reminder to uh, um, uh, bully around the current voting method that we have uh, because uh, uh, it gets away with way too many free passes. To Alan's point, um, speaking to the notion of throwing your support behind local initiatives, I'm wondering what suggestions you might have to um, offer us in terms of how we might move forward to bring this conversation to a broader audience, to um, develop official platforms, get the measure, you know, voted on. How do we how do we move forward, regardless of which method is preferred? What steps would you recommend for getting stuff done? Sure, and um, like a kind of a preface with the work that we're doing. Obviously, we uh, we uh, push for approval voting, and it takes uh, and we've got a, a good track record for that. So, kind of sharing the way that we advance a better voting method. Uh, so, uh, we. So the, the system that we have now that's in place is that we ask people, so when people sign up for our newsletter, uh, which I encourage everyone to do uh, on the call, uh, if you go to electionscience.org, um, it makes it really easy to uh, sign up for our newsletter. Um, so you can go there, sign right up, and then uh, you will get an email from us. Uh, and also if you are in an area that has a lot of uh, uh, other supporters there, um, you will be invited to a local chapter. Uh, and uh, let's see. So uh, once you sign up for the newsletter, if you're in a geographic area that has a lot of support, you'll be invited to a local chapter. And we use those chapters to advance people to basically uh, 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 form a committee uh, and an organization to advance a ballot initiative. So we've got some experience in the space uh, we've already successfully uh, helped uh, the, the local um, group in Fargo, North Dakota to pass approval voting. We did that in uh, 2018. That passed by 63.5%. Uh, uh, right now we're doing the same thing in St. Louis. So Fargo was 120,000 people. Uh, St. Louis is over 300,000 people. And we're just continually scaling that up. Uh, and we have these chapters in multiple cities. And so uh, we work with these local chapters, and uh, from uh, there, uh, they form a formal organization, and then uh, we help them with logistics support and help them with the ability to uh, uh, get uh, approval voting on the ballot, and they are doing an advocacy campaign while we do an education campaign alongside it. And that type of setup or, or, or approach to doing this um, so far has been pretty successful. Uh, so we're looking very promising on our road with uh, St. Louis. And uh, we had that huge win uh, right out of the gate with, with Fargo. Um, and so we're looking forward to, to replicating that. And that's the model that we use to do this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Caitlin also shared the uh, link for the chapter program that we have. Uh, so. cool. Any other uh, questions? I think I saw one in the chat about uh, statewide initiatives. Like right now, are you just doing city by city? Are there any statewide initiatives that you've heard of? Oh, I, I, uh, I love that, that enthusiasm. Like, uh, uh, so, uh, 
the the overall model that that we've taken uh, with this, like as an organization, we have like a research component and. Uh, we're working to develop that. We have a lot of material on our site and we've done these polls. But obviously we have this uh, uh, advocacy component at the same time where uh, we take the data that we have and push it to um, get, so people actually are able to get the benefits of a better voting method. Uh, and our ta overall tactic has been to show proof of concept because here we've taken a voting method that while it's been uh, used in other organizations and studied since the late 1970s, uh, hadn't been used for government elections uh, uh, in, in the US and hadn't been used anywhere since Greece in uh, 1920. So uh, it had a, a good hundred years. Uh, uh, so we had uh, so we had a lot, a pretty big uh, lift there. So the strategy that we had was to show uh, proof of concept and then uh, replicate and scale. So with Fargo, that was the proof of concept component. Uh, we had to show that this could be done uh, as well as like uh, along that timeline as it's being used, collect data and, and seeing how things work out. Um, St. Louis is that replication and scaling. Uh, and then we plan to do that into even larger cities. Um, and uh, 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 and, and part of it is just the, the resources to be able to, to do that scaling. Uh, so like the, uh, some of the smallest states out there are around a million. Um, and so uh, it, it requires the kind of being within that space uh, to, to move up to that. So um, we have it on our radar to move into states, but we're uh, taking progressively higher higher leaps. Uh, so like right now, technically, I mean, we're, uh, uh, we're moving exponentially in terms of uh, the size that we're looking at. So um, uh, uh, St. Louis is two and a half times the size of, of Fargo. Um, and uh, we our, our Vermont, or I see is like, is pointing out that there are only 500,000 people in, in Vermont. Uh, so I think, I think they're trying to, trying to, Focus a little bit. Uh, so, uh, uh, so with uh, St. Louis being uh, two and a half times the size of, of Fargo, and then going to uh, the cities that are, um, or cities or states that are uh, more than double the size of uh, of that. So, uh, so far, so far, like we're moving in terms of exponential uh, growth. Obviously, exponential growth doesn't last forever. And given the situation that we're in now, I sure hope that exponential growth doesn't. Uh, last forever. Uh, uh, for the, the stats people, I uh, like to see that move into an S curve and, and uh, uh, kind of plateau out. Uh, but uh, so, so states are certainly on our radar. Uh, that is part of our, our overall strategic plan. Um, but it's just a matter of, of having those wins that allow us to move into that. Um, and uh, we are, and, and it's, it's also kind of a balance of uh, when we're looking at, at places, we have to have a concentration of support in that location. Uh, there are a bunch of legal issues that we have to look at. So um, obviously they have to have a ballot initiative as a tool because it's very challenging to get uh, uh, represented, representatives uh, to agree to a different voting method than they were elected by. So we have to uh, basically not ask them and, and use this work around using ballot initiatives. So, so there are a number of components that have to line up as well as we're choosing a selection, but we will eventually get into, into states um, as we're hitting bigger areas. Uh, so we, we hit, so, uh, so there's a question about divisiveness uh, and we were able to get into that before. And part of the way that approval voting addresses divisiveness is by allowing you to express opinion about more than uh, one candidate uh, and the current setup just kind of uh, putting us in this corner of basically having us uh, fight against candidates even when we have a lot of common ground. So it sounds like this is uh, in some ways a fledgling stage um, for this organization. And I'm wondering two questions. One, what do you need? What would be optimal in terms of support? Be that 
um, volunteers, be that funding, be that uh, highly visible mouthpiece, what have you. Um, and second question, which organizations are you partnering with to help, um, you know, that share common goals um, in an attempt to, um, you know, share resources and that sort of thing? Yeah. So on the first question in terms of uh, what can folks do? Um, so uh, you, it, it, it may not be completely new that we're talking about something where a lot of people don't know about it. Um, so uh, uh, the biggest thing that our Choose One voting method has going for it uh, uh, is that a lot of people know what it is. And in many cases, they aren't aware of other voting methods. Um, and so being able to uh, share the work that we do and let other people know that this is an issue that they should care about um, because there are other voting methods. And also being able to help make that connection when people are talking about an issue and saying like, you know what, I'm so annoyed that this policy that I care about is just not getting traction, it's not getting airtime uh, by, by candidates. Or when a candidate does bring it up, that they're getting marginalized. Uh, so people just see that end result and they don't, uh, aren't necessarily aware of some of the tools that we have available, like approval voting, that addresses that, that concern. So being able to help bridge the, the gap in knowledge from these challenges that we're facing and the tools that we have available and being able to share our work to help bridge that, that gap in knowledge. Uh, so that's, that's one component that, that you can do. And then, uh, like I mentioned before, we have these chapter systems set up. So by signing up for a newsletter, uh, and also there's the chapter link that, uh, that Caitlin shared in, in the chat window. Those are ways to get involved uh, directly. And those, like by getting involved and being active in those chapters, that is a huge deal because ultimately that's how these things happen uh, by, by the work of, of folks in, in, in these chapters. Um, uh, like uh, many nonprofits, uh, this is something that's uh, quite expensive. Um, uh, really our uh, our organizational capacity could be much uh, greater, like we are very nimble and we're very quick. Uh, for instance, the first major funding that we got at the end of 2017, within a year of that, um, we hired staff and got approval voting implemented in its first US city. Uh, if that doesn't say efficient and nimble, uh, I don't know what does. Uh, so we're very good at what we do, um, but we can absolutely scale up and do more effective work with more funding and we've shown how efficient that we can be. Uh, so those are some of the um, uh, kind of the highlights in terms of what folks can do in terms of sharing uh, the work that we do, letting other people know, uh, 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 donating. Uh, again, like this, uh, this capacity is what allows us to achieve these outcomes. And then uh, if you are uh, in a place where we have a chapter um, being involved there. Uh, so those are, those are some of the uh, common components. In terms of other areas that uh, we work with, um, whenever I'm traveling, I'm constantly working with uh, uh, local chapters of uh, League of Women Voters. Uh, uh, there are a number of other uh, groups that we can normally talk to, talk, talks with as well. Um, uh, open primaries recently, we uh, uh, joined with them uh, and supporting uh, the, uh, the group in St. Louis, STL approves, that's working on the, on the initiative there. Um, and so those are, those are some of the examples. Um, have you oh. considered doing uh, like a TED talk that lays out, you know, the grand vision for how this is going to, you know, save democracy in America and uh, also give uh, you know, this seems like a great topic for a TED talk where you can get in a little bit of depth and just being on that stage would give a little bit of legitimacy to the ideas. That's a yeah. great idea. Yeah, that, that is a great idea. We, we have, um, so uh, we do have some talks out there and uh, Kaylin might be able to share uh, some of them. Uh, one, two that I'm thinking about in particular, uh, one from EA Global, and then the other from uh, the, uh, the uh, JED talk. Um, so the one hyping up the, uh, the um, 
the main leader in the city of, of Fargo. And that was a fun story to tell. Uh, I had a lot of fun giving that talk, um, which is uh, really about uh, uh, someone just refusing to say, like recognizing the problem, uh, refusing to say no when the city ignored him, and then going ahead and doing it anyway. Uh, it's, uh, it's, that was one of my favorite talks to give. Um, and then the other one uh, for the, uh, that I gave a talk at uh, an organization uh, with the EA Global, um, that one is looking at uh, kind of the, the topic area as a whole and why it makes sense as a cause area and why approval voting particularly makes sense. Uh, so those are a couple of talks and I, I see uh, Caitlin going through the, the interwebs as we speak, uh, working to find them. So uh, you, you should see those um, in, the, in the chat window uh, once she's able to, to grab a hold of those. Looks like there's a couple more questions in the um, chat. You might have to scroll through a bit. Cool. Uh, let's see. So we got the uh, Vermont. Um, let's see. Get some voting method uh, comparisons. Um, Well, here's a fun one. Uh, this is from uh, Joel. So Joel is asking about um, uh, with the approval voting, does it make sense to ever uh, choose just one uh, person? Uh, and the answer is yes. There, there are a number of circumstances when it makes sense to choose uh, just one person. Uh, but what's important about approval voting, and let's see, I'll, I'll, I know you're, Caitlin, you're working on giving the, uh, the talk, thanks, so I'll, I'll find the other uh, link here. Um, I go oh, through I, I got, Both of the talks are down there, so if you want me to find another link, I, I'm free. <laughs> are they, are they on there? Oh, I, I don't see the uh, the links for the talks on there. Oh, and I think you're you're muted. All right. And I'll add the critiques one. Um, sorry, sorry, guys. Yeah, I I was accidentally sending the message just to Joyce instead of to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope you enjoyed the talk, Joyce. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the so the question there. Thank you. Uh, yeah. The, the the question um, was about um, what well, does it make sense to choose only one candidate? And certainly, yes, there are absolutely conditions where it makes sense to choose only one candidate. Um, what's important about approval voting is that you have the option to choose more. Um, and the option, so even when, say, uh, most people, even like 75 or 80% of people choose only one candidate, having the option to choose more and that remainder choosing more than one candidate uh, still makes a big deal. Uh, and the reason it makes a big deal is for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, those remainder uh, who choose more than one candidate uh, can have a material difference in terms of changing the winner. So oftentimes when we think of elections, um, unless it was like a, a total runaway, most of the time the margin of victory is less than say like 25%. Uh, and so um, being able to have that remainder uh, come into play uh, can make a difference in terms of, of selecting the winner. The other component is, and, and keeping in mind that changing the voting method doesn't always change the winner. Uh, sometimes the candidate is so strong that regardless of the voting method that they would win in an election. Um, and so uh, one of the things that approval voting does is it does a really nice job gauging the support of all these other candidates, including uh, candidates who, who don't win. Um, and so when, uh, even if you're supporting someone who turns out to be the winner in virtually every other voting method under approval voting, if you're one of those remainder folks who um, are caring about some of these other candidates, um, then you can, 
uh, you can support them. And if you hadn't been able to do that, then these candidates would have gotten virtually uh, no support in many cases. And so uh, even in cases where most people support only one candidate, uh, it could still make a difference with those remainder who choose more than one um, and being able to have a material uh, um, impact in terms of the winner, as well as giving that reflection of support for the other candidates. And uh, we see that on average, the number of approvals per ballot increases as the number of candidates increases. So being able to support more than one candidate becomes particularly important as you have a longer candidate list. Um, and that's another area where approval voting really excels is that you have the super simple ballot design even when your candidate list is very long. Uh, so it's, it, it's adaptable uh, quite well, even in that scenario. Uh, so that's a good question. That's, that's a common one that comes up. And it's not always immediately obvious uh, what that answer is. I saw another one on there about how can we get uh, this going within the two dominant parties uh, who benefit from the current choose one system? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I think that goes back to the, the tactic that we use. Um, so uh, we've had in the past situations come up where uh, we have like a, like a, a wonky uh, representative, like they, they have some kind of engineering or, or, or math background and uh, they're working to do good with their position and they reach out to us and say like, hey, uh, uh, we like what you're doing and we think uh, approval voting would be great for, um, uh, our our state um, a representative there uh, like helped me like draft this bill um, and these opportunities have come up but their their colleagues uh, are in a position where uh, maybe they're not looking at it as altruistically and they say well like you know what I want to get elected and uh, maybe the only reason I got elected was because we're using this kind of bad voting method uh, and I don't want to take my chances with something else and so we, we run into that that dilemma of uh, uh, this kind of conflict of interest. And that conflict of interest is exactly why we don't ask permission. Uh, so we use ballot initiatives uh, as a tool for changing the voting method because by running a ballot initiative where we have the voters themselves say yes or no on whether they wanna implement approval voting, by doing that, uh, we avoid the conflict of interest of asking someone who's already elected to change the, the voting method that would elect them in the future. Uh, so the way that we avoid that is that we uh, we don't ask them. We try to get as many people on board. Uh, so when we're working within a particular area, we're identifying and connecting with all the stakeholders. Uh, some of them are people who are elected. If we can get people who are elected to, uh, to uh, be supportive, uh, we'll absolutely take that support, um, but it's not necessary for us, which, uh, the, uh, which is why we do these ballot initiatives. So we don't have to ask for permission. I would think another tactic could be pursued in parallel would be to try and get the party's uh, nomination processes using these things so that they, uh, it's, let's say it's in the Republican Party's interest to use approval voting in their primaries because they'll, they'll get more consensus candidates that will then go on to win the broader election. Uh, so like, could we push it? Oh, I think you, you faded out. Sorry. Um, uh, so, so could we push it by, by saying like, Hey, uh, Republicans and Democrats, like Democrats, if you want to win elections, you should probably use approval voting in your primaries. It seems like ranked choice is going that way by like turning states primary processes one by one. And that's also getting them broader attention. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that does vary by uh, state by state. Um, and we, like we do work, uh, we haven't as, had as many inroads within major parties on this front. Uh, although interestingly enough, uh, in St. Louis, uh, we're, um, we're doing an open primary system uh, using approval voting where the top two go on to the general election. Uh, there are some technical components within Missouri law that forces to take that particular route, uh, that, that particular route, but it did 
uh, wind up having us work with in the, the primary, uh, there being an open primary, which has some advantages in that context because um, you like, for instance, with a primary nomination, uh, you're dealing with a subset of the population, which is inherently partisan in a way that the rec rest of the population uh, isn't. Uh, so there, by having it an open primary, allowing everyone to take part, and also using approval voting, it is an even better job, job in terms of getting that general support. But e even um, say like with a closed primary, which is kind of like what, what you were describing, uh, when only people within that party can, can vote, um, uh, you can, under approval voting, it would give you a nice consensus winner, uh, but keeping in mind that it would be a consensus winner uh, given uh, people within that, uh, within that, that party. Uh, still, like even with that, like that would be much better. Uh, primaries would do a better job in, in terms of getting nominees that represent their party's ideology. Uh, but I, I, uh, so we've, we've had uh, limited success with those inroads so far, uh, but I think part of that is really just a consequence of where we, where we are in time. Uh, so as we build up these progressively larger wins, um, this is something that's going to be uh, become more apparent and on people's radar. And I think people are going to be open up to that, particularly because of how easy this, um, this is to implement. Uh, so with approval voting, for instance, it's like you don't need any special kind of software. Um, so you don't have that same kind of fiscal cost as you might with uh, other voting methods that require special voting machines that aren't already present. Um, and so uh, it has that kind of shovel readiness. Uh, but I think that's something that parties will warm up to as it becomes something that's more on their radar. The question about um, what you just mentioned, the open primary and having the top two go on to the, to the general, um, doesn't it highly depend on the number of candidates running at that point uh, for each party? So it, let's say you have the population that's equally split between Democrats and Republicans but you have two Republicans running and seven Democrats, then the two Republicans are going to move on to the general election under an approval voting system, right? Uh, so uh, you can't have, within, so within St. Louis, the way it was a little bit different, it was nonpartisan. Um, so it, these, the party labels weren't, weren't required. Um, but if you do have a group uh, of people where two candidates are similar, um, they could even be with, so with an open party, an open primary system where the top two go on to the general election, uh, if you do have two candidates uh, out of the many candidates that are there uh, that are very similar and from the same party, if they're also very popular, uh, yes, it's possible for, for both of them to, to advance. Um, that's one criticism of a top two system. Uh, you could have other systems where you take that same, same kind of setup where you have a nonpartisan open primary and uh, using approval voting, and you can have it to so like the top three or the top four go on to the to the general election. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be two. In St. Louis, we did it as two because there were some issues uh, with uh, with using alternative voting methods in the general election, and so like our hand was a bit forced uh, with that particular example. But there are other approaches to do it in jurisdictions where there's more flexibility. Yeah, thanks, Joel. All right, so we have any uh, remaining questions before we uh, wrap up here? Uh, yeah, I have to sign off, but I just want to say thank you so much for this. I really love this work and I uh, really appreciate everybody in here because this, this really matters for the future. Thank you. Um, for your time. Thank, uh, you're welcome and, and thank you, Alan. We, we're, we're honored to do the work and we, uh, uh, we're grateful that for the for the support and uh, we uh, would love to see you uh, uh, get involved um, thanks so much thanks Alan oh. um, let's see see one kind of tactical issue there uh, for, for folks thinking about the choose one tactic also known as bullet voting I would uh, highly recommend you read the article on uh, critiques and defenses of approval voting um, and I think that the one argument that I mentioned uh, uh, addresses it quite well. Uh, there are a number of circumstances where it, it makes a lot of sense to choose uh, more than one candidate, uh, particularly if 
um, it's a, a tight race and there's someone that you really don't want to see win, uh, it can be really important to hedge your bets um, to, uh, to mitigate against uh, uh, someone you really don't like winning. Um, and then there's a, a scenario that I think many of us have been in before, which is uh, like imagine a race where uh, there's a third party or independent candidate, they're not getting very much support. Um, normally under a choose one method, you might think, well, like I don't want to vote for them because I don't want to throw my vote away. Under approval voting, you're in an entirely different world. So there um, you can make sure that you have a, an impact with the outcome of the election. Uh, you can uh, choose um, uh, among your, your uh, who like the, the best among the front runners. Um, and then in addition to that, you can also support other candidates who bring great ideas to the table that you'd like to see uh, move up in their support so that they're not marginalized. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, of uh, conditions in which it makes sense to choose multiple candidates. Um, and particularly with a, a long ballot list, when you have a lot of, when you increase the likelihood of having candidates there that you agree with. Um, and if you look at the articles that we put out, both the one on uh, leading up to Super Tuesday, as well as the one in November, um, you see a lot of people uh, rationally uh, going ahead and supporting multiple candidates. Cool. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, uh, so for other stuff, um, you can always interact with us in the future on social media. Uh, we're on all of them, I'm pretty sure, except for uh, uh, Pinterest for not, uh, but you can find the pictures that we take on uh, on Facebook and and Twitter. Uh, we don't need to be on all of them. And there's uh, we're on LinkedIn, uh, so you can join us on there. Uh, we've got YouTube videos, so you can check us out on YouTube. Um, most importantly, I would encourage everyone to sign up for our newsletter. If you are not already signed up, uh, you can do that right from our homepage. Uh, make it super easy because we really want you to sign up. Uh, so. I want to thank everyone again uh, to uh, for joining us and give Caitlin a moment to uh, so she's not on under pressure for getting that link. Um, let's see for the uh, uh, yeah we're not on we're not on TikTok either. Um, I would do uh, I I think maybe some of our other staff would do better. I would do terribly on on TikTok. TikTok, I have, uh, I have no doubts about that. Um, and let's see, uh, so the YouTube ones are up. Uh, I think someone's asking about that. Okay, cool, looks like. Caitlin. If there was anything else that um, folks need or any resources, um, even if you think of it later, feel free to just email me and I can send you things. Awesome. Um, and I put I put our um, our email addresses in the chat, but you can also, if you lose access to this chat, you can find those on our website too, on the Meet the Team page. Cool. Well, thank you all for joining us. I encourage you to sign up for our, our newsletter um, and also donate to support our work. Uh, we make it really easy to do that, as you might expect, uh, on our website. Um, and uh, Thank you for, for joining us. We, we really appreciate the support that you give. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, all. Thank you.